Thomas uh, Leif Steinberg. As the Dean of the Aga Khan University Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations, AKUISMC, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the fourth lecture in a series of eight public events titled Pluralism and Plurality in Islamic Cultures. This series is a collaboration between the Aga Khan Trust for Culture based in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, and the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, Canada. Today's lecture, titled Border Belonging and Exclusion, Afghans in Pakistan, discusses the case of border making between Pakistan and Afghanistan and how it relates to regional and global trends. Alongside analyzing the infrastructure and technologies that are part of this story, this event pays attention to the people involved, Afghans in Pakistan. By doing so, this approach reveals the tension between how the state tries to perform the border from above and how this is resisted from below. On a personal note, I recently published a paper in a book about refugees from Afghanistan and Syria arriving in Sweden. Adding to the global perspective, about 9,000 minors defined as Afghanis are currently in Sweden. The debate about them and their future has been intense, and some of them have been deported to Afghanistan. The decision to deport Afghanis was taken by the government, and it is criticized and supported depending on the stance you take on migrants. One reason for the criticism is that many of the young boys, a large portion of them are boys, are coming from Iran and to a lesser extent Pakistan to Sweden. Consequently, the discussion on, uh, of Afghan refugees in Pakistan connects to debates on migrants in Western Europe and make this discussion truly global. Back to Sana. Drawing from 10 years of fieldwork in Pakistan, as well as Europe and Turkey, she has recently joined the AKUISMC as an assistant professor in political science. Before that, Sana had fellowships in Berlin at the Leibniz Centrum Moderne Orient and Freie Universität Berlin. She has also held academic positions at the Department of Political Science, Peshawar, and so has Lockwood. I would like to take this opportunity to formally welcome the newly appointed assistant professor at the Aga Khan University Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations. So please join me in a round of applause in welcoming Dr. Sam Ali. And before I end, being also a dean and representing AKUSMC, I would like to wave this one in front of you. This is advertisement for a course, a summer program, Gender in Muslim Context, at the beautiful San Servolo, outside Venice, nine days in July. Who can resist that? <laughs> there are more information over here. Sana, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Leif, for the very kind introduction. and. It's really wonderful to be here at the Institute, and it's wonderful to be a new member of this Institute as well. So I'm glad to be speaking here today in my inaugural lecture at um, the Al Khan University. I'm going to start off very briefly by showing you a two minute um, clip of some audio and some images. And then I will move on to some of my ethnographic work and discussions. And so if you will um, allow me to just share with you the video clip. We'll start off from that. <clears throat> Is it okay if we maybe start again? 
नहीं नहीं मैं वही हूँ लेक्चर में ही हूँ आप आ जाओ खुदा फैस Okay, so thank you uh, very much. And what I'll do over the course of the next 25 minutes or so is just talk to you a little bit about uh, some of my work that I've been conducting and will also tie back into some of the clips and the images that I've shown you here as well. So if you'll allow me, I'll start on with the lecture. I have been conducting ethnographic observations in a registration centre. I have been conducting ethnographic observations in a registration centre for Afghans in Pakistan. I would usually enter the office just before the official opening hours in the early morning, and I would leave after closing, some 30 minutes before sunset prayers. I would move from one room to another or I would be on the outside grounds where there were small patches of grass and a few trees for shade. As I set myself the task of observing and interviewing people who were waiting to be registered with an identity card or to pick one up. Hundreds of people would be there every single day. They would come in from different parts of the city and some would travel much longer distances. 
Most people who are there are waiting from early morning until the evening. They are given a barcode, an individual number printed on a piece of paper. They're then photographed, they have their fingerprints scanned, and they have their personal information taken, retaken, checked, double-checked, and stored in the national database. <clears throat> Some unlucky ones don't get to be seen on that day and have to come back the next morning. Without accommodation arrangements, some, usually the men, find it easier to sleep outside, waiting for the morning to come. Time appears here to exist in a different dimension. Indeed, as sociologist Pierre Bourdieu has told us, waiting is one of the privileged experience, ways of experiencing the effects of power. Waiting implies submission. And so they wait. People arrive at the center with their thermoses of tea, blankets, homemade food and snacks. This they know is going to be a long affair. Street walkers have also heard that there are people there waiting throughout the day and they have set up a drink and food cart outside the office. For a precarious labor force, the chance to earn an extra income cannot be missed. The preparedness of the people in question, the people who I was observing for my fieldwork, is telling of the seriousness with which ordinary people, especially those of low income backgrounds, understand the bureaucratic workings of the state, and in this case, the international migration regime. It also shows an understanding of the need to have a legal status, to have documents, to exist, even if it's not as citizens. Afghanistan is one of the world's largest refugee and irregular migrant producing countries. And since the 1970s, Pakistan has been host to the largest number of Afghans worldwide, followed closely by Iran. In the West, for want of a better term, the xenophobia of the current climate and the mainstream of anti-migration policies may lead you to believe that the entire world is relocating here. In the so-called refugee crisis of 2015, certainly large numbers of people were migrating and moving and entering these states, and Afghans formed the second largest population seeking asylum after Syrians. But the bigger picture shows us another story, that just 10 countries hold, host 56% of the world's refugees. They are located <coughs> in the Arab world, the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia. The combined wealth of these countries accounts for 2.5% of the global economy. At its peak, some say that there were around about 8 million Afghans living in Pakistan, and in 2020, the figure is smaller than that, and it's closer to about 3 million. For some 10 years now, as Leif has introduced, I've been working on the story of Afghan mobility and immobility in Pakistan, <coughs> and I have been trying to work to document and analyze these stories. And I'm particularly interested in this story of mobility within the so-called global south. One of the tensions within my work in Pakistan that has kept appearing and reappearing has been this question of how and why do the non-citizens, in this case Afghans, navigate borders and belonging from below in the so-called post-colonial state? And how and why is this resisted so forcefully from above? In this story, infrastructures, surveillance technologies, documents and violence appear to be an important part, especially from above. In 2006 to 2007, after a nationwide census of Afghans in Pakistan, all Afghans who were considered refugees were given a computerized identity card. The registration since then has been periodically updated and expanded. Can everyone hear me at the back? Thanks. In 2017, a similar process started for undocumented Afghans as well in the country. So both those who are considered refugees and undocumented migrants have now all been, or vast majorities of them, have been given identity cards and documents. Some, of course, have, have not been registered as well. In the registration centers that I was working in, representatives from the government of Afghanistan and Pakistan were there, and so were representatives of the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. <clears throat> they were there and part and parcel of the tripartite agreements that have been that are in effect to manage Afghans in Pakistan. As well as the government officials who were present and the data processors and the people themselves, there would always be a lone man, usually of an imposing stature, dressed in Western attire, an iron-pressed collared shirt and jeans or trousers, 
and nearly always sunglasses for some reason present too. I was never officially told who he was, yet the retired military status prefix to his name always gave away the clue as to where his loyalties lay within the configurations of power within the Pakistani state. Whilst most Afghans who live in Pakistan today were either born in the country or the children of Afghan nationals who migrated in the 70s and 80s, naturalization and formal belonging has never been possible. It's never really been tabled and on the cards. The only routes to full legal membership and belonging are through marriage, but this is gendered. Only Afghan women who marry Pakistani men can become Pakistani citizens. The same doesn't apply for Afghan men marrying Pakistani women. Another route has been approached, has been taken on, and that is what political scientist Kamal Sadiq has called the process of becoming a paper citizen. A process whereby individuals become citizens by bribery, forgery, and the accumulation of a variety of documents. At the registration center that I was in, data processors were trying to sift through these cases. Whilst the South Asian state is notorious for the regimes of paper that it produces and the forgery that often accompanies this, the database and its accompanying technologies appear to be making some sort of difference to the story. Shah Jahan, a data processor who was there, told me, now if anyone has an Afghan card and a Pakistani card, it gets flagged up on the system straight away. This is how we catch people out. And sure enough, when individuals who had both cards were caught out, a commotion would ensue. The individual would be taken aside for interrogation by a government representative, and the man with the sunglasses would also appear on the scene. Some shouting, some insults, and some pushing and shoving would also take place. Often it was sunglasses Wada who was offering the first blow. Other Afghans in the center would also be peering over, trying to understand exactly what is happening. And here we see confusion and fear being publicly created by the everyday state, as other Afghans are observing this so-called border transgressor in the urban center being castigated for their acts. The person who was caught would usually have the Pakistani identity card revoked on the database and often they were arrested. Today, when we think about borders, Understandably, often our focus has, is moving towards the geographic frontier and their accompanying mammoth infrastructures. In the age of Trump, the image of the US-Mexico war comes to mind, the war in Israel and occupied Palestinian territories. And in South Asia too, India has constructed its fence, a fence along the eastern border it has with Bangladesh, and Pakistan too has also started to construct a fence along the Afghanistan-Pakistan border two-thirds of this physical fence have been completed. And these infrastructures are very important in their function and as symbols of sovereign power and the limits of the territorial nation. But as the events at the registration center show, the border is also being performed into effect in the city, in the registration center. Scholars have told us that sovereignty and thereby the border are not just there, they're not just fact but they have to be performed into being by repeat acts every day, by government actors, by citizens, and by other agents. The violence of sunglasses vala is one way. And if the modern state is defined by this relationship between population, territory, and sovereignty, so too is having control over who can enter, who can exit, and who counts as a full member. As John Torpy, the historian of the passport, has told us, the modern state emerges not just to have a monopoly over violence as per Weber or a control over production as per Marx, but also to have a control over mobility. The regime of document servers and databases that we see that have shaped the international system are an indication of this. Today, new technologies have made the border ubiquitous. We see the border in inner city airports, at the registration center, at the checkpoint, up there somewhere stored on the cloud, st stored in databases, stored on servers. It's carried in this identity card and it's carried in their databases. And it's also stored and based on biometric information, which in the words of political geographer, Luis Amore, have made the body a passcode on the route to belonging, and in some cases, non-belonging. In a poem by the 17th century poet and thinker Rahman Baba, he asks his audience, 
When a traveler leaves his home, who knows if he is a nobleman or a slave? Once he becomes earth mixed with earth, then who can tell whose grandchild he is? Today, Rahman Baba might be surprised to find that the answer to this question is possible in very precise terms. Since the 2000s, Pakistan has also introduced an identity card for its own citizens. Many of us will be familiar with it, the Shanakhi card as it's commonly known, or the CNIC card, the Computerized Nationalized Identity Card. The government says that this ID card is a way of improving governance techniques, and it certainly is in many ways. In part, this is very true. The card and its accompanying database is a bigger part of the puzzle that tries to help the modern state, and in some cases also the colonial state, to make the people within it legible. How can the state grab a hold of the people who live within its territories and make them legible in order to be able to govern them effectively, in order to be able to deliver the rights to them effectively? This also applies to the international migration regime, where ID cards and registers have been central to providing refugee relief. The first identity card that Afghans were given was issued in 1980, and it was centered around rations, which I should be able to show you. I would like to show you an image of this as well. images. So I'll just show you a few images now before I carry it on. Some from the registration center that I've mentioned. This is the 1980s refugee passbook. This passbook would usually be issued to one household member. So it wasn't given to every single individual, it would usually be given to one household head. Usually the household head would be a male. For Afghans in Pakistan, the identity card has also been a site of documentary identity making. The Afghan card is different to the Pakistani one, and this of course was applicable in 1980, when the terminology of hard muhajirin, refugee, is being used. The nation is not just imagined to borrow from Benedict Anderson, but it is also codified and comes to life through documents, as John Torpy tells us. In addition, today it is the openly stated objective of the government and the United Nations High Commission for Refugees to use the ID card and the databases to enable return to Afghanistan. It really underpins refugee repatriation and undocumented migrant repatriation policy that is at the heart of Afghan management within Pakistan today. Here then, this form of document acts as a form of exclusionary surveillance to prove that individuals do not belong to it. Surveillance here is not being used necessarily to issue rights per se, but it is used to withdraw state responsibility. And aside from repatriation schemes, the ID card has somehow inadvertently also supported or perhaps made worse the everyday forms of harassment that people experience in everyday life in the country. The card itself, a physical document, acts as a material artifact. It acts as a form of media. In a climate where security checkpoints are the norm, and so too are forms of profiling, and not just for Afghan nationals, but also for other ethnic groups and marginalized groups within the country. The plastic con card confirms in more accurate terms whether you are considered or constructed as a threat or not. And it has made the targeting of Afghans a bit more concise. So if we imagine ourselves in a place where checkpoints are the norm and you're passing through the checkpoint and you are asked for your ID card, you know, this is basically just a form of profiling that gets more accurate because the card can clearly tell you what nationality you are, or what, in the case um, of the Pakistani identity card, it might tell you what province you are from, and which province you are from can also be associated with ethnicity as well. 
the increased amount of harassment in day-to-day -day life that many Afghans have faced is not simply just the result of an identity card and a document. There are bigger political issues, of course, at play. And indeed, the, the everyday forms of violence that many people would face can't just be reduced to an issue of ID cards. We must be reading these documents and databases and servers in the political context in which they're operating. But the context seems to be quite clear. The policy of repatriation or of Afghans leaving is certainly the narrative that is coming down quite forcefully from above. Pakistan has been in this position before where regimes of documentation and surveillance were used to control mobility across borders and thus make and remake borders. India too, of course, has been here before in 1947. This was the obvious, most obvious case in which regimes of documentation were important to the foundations of these two states. Historian Vazira Zamindar has shown how the creation of India and Pakistan was not simply just defined by a moment of arrival when the clock struck 12 in August 1947. Rather, both countries' territorial borders evolved over a period of years, what she has referred to as the long partition, that required the control over populations and their movements and their mobilities through permits introduced in 1948, through passports introduced in 1952, and the surveillance of refugee camps. If one imagines the subcontinent as it was divided, these new nations and these new borders are quite puzzling. How is it that people accepted them straight away? Well, of course they didn't. People were still moving across those borders in quite fluid ways, she argues, from 47 up until 51, when both states, following quite closely with each other, introduced the 1951 Citizenship Acts and 52 Citizenship Acts. Some, of course, have said that partition and these processes of border making have never really stopped. Even today, there are firm restrictions on visas issued to Indian citizens in Pakistan. Indian citizens who are granted entry into the country are often placed, placed under tight surveillance. And of course, the same applies to Pakistanis traveling in India. And as we stand here today, in India, thousands are protesting the Citizenship Amendment Act which was passed in late 2019. The act centers on neighboring and regional migrants and says that it will offer citizenship to Hindus, Sikhs, Jains and Parsis and Christians, but will not do the same for Muslims. Naturalization for Muslim migrants is not an option. In part, this is certainly the legacy of partition continuing to play out today but it also is the specific result of the objectives of the Hindu nationalist project of the BJP, who are trying to overturn the secular nature of Indian law and the Indian constitution. Here too, in the Indian context today, we see that the question of borders, both internal and external, are interconnected. And here too, we see that a regime of documents and proposals for the implementations of new registers, databases, and technologies for population management are geared towards determining who can or who cannot belong. Already the national registration of citizens in Assam has rendered 1.9 million people stateless. And the proposals for this to be carried out across the country are part and parcel of what these protests that are happening today are all about. Today in Pakistan, I contend that it is the Afghanistan-Pakistan border that is being performed into effect. And an obvious question will emerge is, well, why now? You know, the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, which is highly contested, um, dates back to a colonial agreement in 1893 between the British colonial state in India and the Afghan state under Amir Abdul Rahman. Pakistan inherited this particular borderline. And effectively, the border region has been marked up until 2018 by the tribal areas, which were governed by draconial colonial laws and effectively placed the area under a zone of legal exception. It made the border um, a formality rather than a lived reality. Pakistani police, for example, couldn't enter into the border areas as it was governed under tribal law. So population movements across the borderland which usually would take place with quite ease. 
Initially, after the formation of Pakistan, there were certainly tensions between Afghanistan and Pakistan, which centered around the Durand Line, this border area. But Pakistan wasn't too concerned about controlling population mobility across the border. Why? Because the numbers of people who were moving across the border were quite small. And two, it had its attention on India, on the eastern border. And of course, then later in 1971, with the civil war and the secession of East Pakistan and formation of Bangladesh. In the 1980s, 1970s and 80s, this changes with mass numbers of Afghans who are coming into the country as a result of the rise of the Communist Party and then the Soviet Afghan invasion. So Afghans who move in need to be documented, but by and large, this mobility was actually welcome. It was welcome as a part of a broader strategy in the Cold War context, as supported by the US, of course, to support, fund and launch in the holy war against the communist menace. And the, this fluid borderland was, was very useful. Now, if we fast forward to the late 90s and the 2000s, the story, of course, changes quite dramatically. After 2001, geopolitical interests are reconfigured. Pakistan joins um, the US in the war on terror. And the war on terror, of course, also bled into Afghanistan. The fluid border becomes a nuisance. With 67,000 people killed in the war in Pakistan alone and 120,000 at least in Afghanistan, the fluidity of the border is no longer celebrated in such great terms. And in the mid-2000s, under pressure for the from the US for the first time since 1948, the state engaged directly in military action in the tribal areas to try to get control. And leaked documents show how the US government encouraged the Pakistani administration to really get control over the border, which meant in terms of infrastructure, surveillance, but also population management too. Tensions over the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan and the two governments have also resurfaced, as we know. So to help perform the border into effect, to help make the border more real, a few things have been quite important. One has been, of course, political reform in these tribal areas that sit between Afghanistan and Pakistan, in Pakistan. The tribal areas are now a full legal member of the Pakistani state. And the other thing has been, as what I've been talking about, is the control over the mobility of Afghans in the country as well. Since the mid 2000s, millions of Afghans, some 4.2 million, have moved to Afghanistan either voluntarily or because they feel they have no other choice and are increasingly unwelcome in the country. It's certainly driven by genuine attachments to Afghanistan. It's certainly driven by the market and economic opportunities. It's certainly driven by social connections. It's certainly driven by forms of national identity. But in many cases, it's also driven by violence and by fear. Others are unable and unwilling to leave and to move to Afghanistan. The three million Afghans who remain in Pakistan today are one of those examples. So they do one of two things. They either move to other countries, as Leif has mentioned, moving towards the European mobility, circuits of mobility, or some remain in Pakistan, but in more fearful ways. And I was particularly interested as my work progressed on this question of what happens to those who remain what happens to their lives, um, and how, how is it that they are navigating these particular circumstances. Because whilst borders and belonging is certainly enforced from above, it is also negotiated by the actions of the individual and the groups from below. Whilst these rational epistemologies that are rooted in the number and order and the idea that certain units can be moved from one area to the other, that you must belong to one bigger territorial unit. When I worked with people from below and was reconstructing micro histories of low income neighborhoods, the picture was much more complex. Modern governance techniques have shifted towards quest from questions of civic participation to the issue of number and population management. But for people on the ground, this is not necessarily the story that they are part of. <clears throat> Afghans in Pakistan, those who remain, haven't simply been waiting as numbers or as barcodes. They haven't simply been waiting for 40 years to go home. In sociological terms, for many, they are home. They have transformed spaces into places and have emotional ties and meaning in them. 
Indeed, from 2015, when I worked with Afghans, some including minors in Europe, in, in Germany and in France, those who were facing the threat of deportation insisted that they would get back to Pakistan and not Afghanistan. Afghans in Pakistan are not full rights bearing citizens. The power of geopolitics and the state security apparatus means that this is unlikely to change. The nature of a security conscious post-colonial state makes the likelihood of becoming a formal legal member, as is perhaps the model in some other states where the model minority or the model illegal, quote unquote, can become citizen, doesn't seem to be the model that will be applied in the Pakistan context. Despite this, however, many have created practices of belonging. And this is especially the case in the South Asian city, which itself has a long history of exchange and mobility across the region. Indeed, cities are especially privileged sites for considering the renegotiations of belonging itself. Afghans living in Karachi, for example, often evoke a Karachiite status, claiming that the city is a part of their identity, which is heard when they say in Urdu, Ham Karachi ke hain, we are of Karachi. Meanwhile, in Peshawar, Afghans, Pashtuns and non-Pashtuns articulate an attachment to the city that is rooted both in the historical significance of it to the region and the claims that various identities make to it, but is also shaped by the lived experiences that they have had in these spaces, the attachments to these cities that are shaped and formed by the struggles and acts of placemaking that they engage in. These groups are producing new urban identities that are certainly marked by insecurity and precariousness, but they also built on everyday lived experiences and constructions of <coughs> insania or humanity that cut across lines of national distinction and echo what Yasmin Saika has identified as the split nature of the human subject in South Asia. Those who can attach themselves to multiple identities in lieu of the failings of nation building in the region. These voices, these experiences are crucial to listen to if we want to be able to understand forms of belonging that are not just bound by the constructing lenses of legal identities in South Asia. These are pervasive and they have a remarkable staying power. I'll close with a brief excerpt from an interview that I did with Balwasha, a 60 year old woman who was living on the rural to urban interface of an informal housing area in Peshawar. She told me, it was hard for me here at first. I had four sisters and stayed behind in, who stayed behind in Nangarhar. I did not want to leave them. Things were never the same for me after I had left them. When we first settled here in this area, it was a scary place to live. The house started off as a tent and all the houses in this area actually were tents. There was nothing here. It was all jungle, wild. But Afghans live here now, Pakistanis too. Most are masons and laborers. We have slowly built and transformed the area together. We have populated this place, given it life, making it into a town. We have changed the city. We have even built the other parts of it. Falwasha moved to Peshawar in the mid 70s. And in part, Falwasha is telling us a story about the city's urban expansion and Peshawar's urban expansion. She tells us about how the city's massive growth over the past 40 years is taking place on the rural to urban interface and is marked by refugees, undocumented migrants, as well as Pakistani citizens. These are also the parts of the city, these are also people who have built other parts of the city that she refers to, such as more well-off areas that were built using migrant labor in the 1970s and 1980s. But she was also doing something else. She was using both the individual I and the collective we to explain to me that Peshawar was her city and one that belonged to a collective Afghan and Pakistani identity. She has an emotional and territorial attachment, certainly in imagining to her ancestral village and the family relationships that she has there with her sisters. Palwasha and her family, however, and her, they also never attained Pakistani citizenship through these informal channels, which is perhaps why these attachments also remain quite a part of her vocabulary in every day-to-day -day life. This stands somewhat in contrast with some of her neighbors, for example, Softa, who was an Afghan Pashtun who migrated to the city in the 90s. And he became Pakistani through the informal appropriation of the Pakistani identity card. 
And he explained to me, no, no, we are Pakistani now. I have the documents and the documents mean that I am Pakistani. This for him seems to determine his identity and his belonging. He expresses an understanding that he is now a formal citizen, shaped by paper documents, the computerized database, and the impact that this has on his life. Yet Balwasha maintained that despite not having the documentation, that her attachment to the city, rather than the nation, to the city were real. This city was hers, her, hers, and she, her husband, and others like her had given Bishal life. As a scholar working on the issue of documenting the story of non-citizens in Pakistan, I wonder if her attachments to the city are being undermined by the discourse of refugee repatriation, of the repatriation of undocumented migrants. These programs are being instilled now with new ubiquitous technologies that make the disciplinary force of the nation felt state felt very strongly, and certainly more strongly than these local attachments, perhaps. Refugee camps are being closed down, schools and health facilities too. Balwasha questions her position in the city, yet she remained clear that she and others like her are the ones who built and transformed the city. They too, she told me, have a right, have a hook to it. Thank you very much. So many thanks, Anna. Now the floor will be open for questions. Well, thank you very much. It was a very good lecture. And uh, the question I want to ask you is how much Pakistan itself has benefited from the migration or refugee, Afghan refugees? Thank you. Thank you, Sana, Professor Sana. I will make some corrections, whatever you said in that, and would add as well, because I as well do research on Afghanistan, like my husband. Um, First of all, uh, it's important to tell the audience that Pakistani constitution itself does not stop Afghans to become citizens because Pakistani constitution does allow people to become citizens when they are born in Afghanistan. It doesn't happen. Imran when became the, uh, the prime minister of Pakistan. He, in fact, uh, offered citizenship, kind of uh, citizenship, and he talked about it, And uh, but it did not happen because of political reasons. Uh, and then uh, if there is no uh, police in Fata region, ex Fata region, then there, there are army and levy, which actually controls borders. And it's not uh, unregistered uh, uh, Mahajirin or migrants are not, uh, not in some number. Uh, there are not just some Afghans there. Uh, around 1 million unregistered people are there, uh, Afghans who are not registered. And um, my question is about, you know that, uh, Sana, that uh, uh, Afghanistan is uh, sharply divided on ethnic, religious, and uh, economic uh, uh, backgrounds that, citizen, uh, that people are divided. How, what did you do to actually balance, balance your sample? And um, what solution do you see uh, as the most practical, practical one for people who want to return? Because you know that after a few months, their registration will finish. And even the, more, the registered one have to leave uh, Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, both of you, for, for the questions. Um, so in terms of, I'll perhaps start with the first question. Oh, sorry. I always forget about the microphone. So, so in terms of the first question, um, how much has Pakistan benefited from the presence of Afghans in the country? I think um, it's important to note that it's quite a large population and quite a varied population that has really started to enter the country from the 1970s in really large numbers. But there were also many Afghans who came under a Yub Khan's decade of development um, who also sought out, uh, sought out to work in Pakistan for economic opportunity because a lot of the economic growth and the boom that was happening in the country. But from the 70s and um, 80s onwards, through the different waves of Afghan migration that happened because of the Soviet war, the rise of the Taliban, the civil war, and so on, you really see that um, you can quite see it tangibly in economic terms. They often form up in, in cities such as Peshawar, Karachi, Islamabad, Bindi, 
um, Balochistan, often many of these Afghan groups are participating in economies. So if we were trying to quantify it in just kind of economic terms, per se, in very simple terms, there has been a large contribution in terms of contributions to the economy. One of the examples I always turn to is this in Peshawar itself, in Hayatabad, there's a neighborhood that is a very well-planned city, well-planned well -planned part of the city and well-planned neighborhood. And much of that particular neighborhood was built um, through Afghan labor of the 1970s, 1980s and 1990s in particular. So there have been these contributions in economic terms, but also in cultural terms, many people will say that there are positive contributions. But um, in the sense of has Pakistan benefited, certainly it's quite a big, broad question to, to try to tackle. Um, and I think that certainly the picture is quite a mixed picture. I think what I would like us to also think about is that, is more broadly speaking, when you have large numbers of people migrating from one country to another, it does certainly place a lot of weight on the infrastructures and facilities and sources and all of these things. And um, one of the questions that I'm more concerned with and more worried about is that how this is always happening and quite happening quite often in the global south and in the global south states. So in the broader question, how much has Pakistan benefited? It's certainly a mixed bag, but there are certain key, key contributions. I tend to let, lean towards highlighting the positive contributions just because the debate at the current moment is so negative towards the Afghan position in Pakistan. And as to your, uh, your intervention. Shall I, shall I correct now you again? Because you said that Afghans, the contribution of Afghan you started from 1960s, because Ayub Khan was at that time, if I'm correct. Uh, basically, Afghan started to come to Pakistan in big, big number uh, at the time when Pakistan and India were one. And in fact, one president of Pakistan uh, Yahya Khan was an Afghan and he was Hazara. At the moment, not just Peshawar, but in Quetta, there are regions in, in Quetta which are owned by Hazaras and they are very proud Hazaras and they are contributing hugely to, uh, to, uh, uh, to the economy of Pakistan and they, they are uh, working at very big uh, numbers in big offices. So it's not just that it's a recent thing, it's, it's more than 100 years that Afghans have been contributing and migrating to Pakistan. Thank you. No, thank you for your intervention. I think that's an important point to take into account that the mobility across the region is quite a long historical one. And certainly the case of the Hazaras in Balochistan, they have had somewhat of a different story to perhaps the other groups and the other ethnicities, because many in that case have actually become formal citizens because of various networks. So thank you for those interventions. Um, and I think in terms of the other, other points that you've main, uh, mentioned, um, or corrections that you've mentioned rather, as you've, point, as you've said yourself, the issue of kind of, uh, of Pakistan, in, in law it's correct that technically anybody who is born in the country should be able to become a Pakistani citizen unless they are from an enemy state. And technically speaking, Afghanistan is not an enemy state, right? That is something that is reserved officially only for Israel um, in terms of passport and documents and getting things done. However, in practice, it is absolutely next to impossible to get formal citizenship and to become a formal uh, Pakistani if you are Afghan. The only real way to do it is through these informal channels. And every single kind of person who you'll speak to from government officials to the UNHCR officials have always said in quite clear unequivocal terms, naturalization is not on the table, it's not on the cards. Um, and towards the figure of unregistered refugees, that's absolutely correct, it's 1.5 around about that figure. Um, but the reality of the tribal areas and the border being fluid and being mobile is certainly one that cannot be ignored which has of course now been changed as these new infrastructures and new technologies are taking place. Um, in terms for you know, the samples that I've used, so this is building on 10 years of, of research. And I really worked with lots of different groups from in Islamabad, Karachi and Peshawar were my main sites. And they were not just Pashtuns who I was working with, but also, mm -hmm. yeah. so I was working with various groups, Pashtuns, but in Karachi, which itself is quite a mixed and cosmopolitan city, within Pakistanis itself, the Afghan sample 
and the Afghan ethnic makeup is also quite diverse. So whereas in Peshawar, around about 80% of Afghans are Pashtun origin, in Karachi, it's only around about 50%. The rest are Uzbek, Hazara, Tajik, Turkmen, and other groups. So the samples that I'm using and talking about, I am talking in quite general terms. I'm not speaking about particular and specific ethnic groups, but these are broader examples that can be applied to these different categories. Whilst there are lots of different ethnicities of Afghan, certainly, and they also play out in Pakistan, what I found is that the ways in which these documents and these national documents um, are being put into force, they are also kind of blanketing over a lot of these ethnic differences within the Pakistan context. The story is quite different in Afghanistan, where there has been a lot of controversy over ethnicities, or whether or not they should be included on the e Tazkira um, identity cards there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wish to congratulate you because uh, the issue of uh, migrants or refugees or registered or unregistered immigrants uh, is not a easy topic and if you have been able to continue it for 10 years, uh, that speaks of your tenacity, of your valor. Uh, it's not an easy chore at all. Uh, in your survey of literature, uh, did you find similar scholarly attempts done about the Afghan refugees in countries with which Afghanistan has long borders? So Iran or Tajikistan or Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan. Uh, because uh, all these countries would have some considerations and there must, might be overlap of uh, issues of uh, security, sovereignty, uh, surveillance, um, and uh, related uh, issues. So. Uh, a contemporary example that comes to mind is, uh, would I, if apply uh, to uh, interview people at the point of registration in Turkey mm -hmm. of refugees coming from Syria, uh, would, I, uh, would I survive 10 days? <laughs> so, uh, so did you fathom the difficulty which other scholars in, uh, on the same subject would, might have, may have been encountering? Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the question. I would have absolutely loved to have done work on all of the countries that you have mentioned. Um, and there is some really, really interesting work that has been done and published on Iran. Um, there's some very exciting new work that's been done by a former student of mine, um, Panis Musawi, who looks at um, Afghan women um, in Iran and the interconnections of Afghan mobility in, um, between Iran and Kabul as well. There's also, of course, the wonderful work of the scholar Susanna Oswalska in um, the University of Oxford, who has also looked at some of the, the difficulties in terms of citizenship rights that Afghans have faced in these countries and refugee rights in these countries, as well as forms of cultural practices of belonging through poetry, through artwork, through gender relations and the like. And the Iranian example, of course, is the one that I would naturally turn to just because the numbers and the figures are comparable to what has taken place in the Pakistan context. And the Iranian story, of course, is quite different to the Pakistan story um, on a number of levels, on a number of levels of the terms of who's migrated there have usually been uh, Farsi-speaking migrants um, rather than Pashtuns, and also the nature of um, being able to become, uh, the, the nature of the state in Iran has been somewhat more strict than say Pakistan has been in allowing and enabling mobility. In 2016, many Afghans who had been living in Iran were given a choice, either go and fight on the front lines in Syria in the, in the conflict in order to defeat ISIS or be deported to Afghanistan. So that political context of Iran and what is happening there and today, of course, there has been renewed pressure on the um, Afghans to be deported from Iran again is also something that is quite clear and in the public eye as well. So I think those, those parallels are quite interesting and important to make and would perhaps put together a bigger picture of the Afghan story in the region. So thank you.
Thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, I was particularly interested in where you were talking about how you know, Afghans navigate their own uh, and construct their own identities in relation to the fixed dates and the border checks and passports and legalization of documents. But I was wondering if um, the kind of picture of identity construction and building relationships is different on the level of Afghans to Pakistans, um, on the level of ordinary citizens to each other, particularly within cities, and how those relationships are navigated or constructed. Sana, thank you very much for your lecture. Now, since this is Aga Khan University, people come here to be educated. Now, I'm not one of those who is really educated about this border dispute or the refugees problem. It happens all over the world, India, Pakistan, Kashmir, and Syria, and Palestine, and all that kind of thing. Now, can you tell me, you know, what is the aim of this lecture? What are you actually proving to us? Uh, what is the purpose of this lecture? How can I be educated about this lecture? Thank you. Thank you for both of the questions. I'll perhaps start with the, uh, the last question. Thank you very much for attending, and I'm glad that you are, you are here. I think what I was trying to um, to convey in this discussion is a mixture of a mixture of things, but mainly I was trying to show the picture of the Afghan migrant in Pakistan as something that is complicated, but also something that people are trying to navigate. I was trying to show that from above, <coughs> there are lots of powers. Lots so of it is not about borders; it is about refugees. They're interconnected. They are both okay. connected to each other. So it is about, certainly about those refugees and how they themselves are, in effect, the border. So it's this idea that I was trying to convey is that the border is not just at the frontier. The border is not just the line on the map that we have become so accustomed to, but that the ways in which people can move or cannot move is also very much to, as part and parcel of the process of border making of the border becoming into effect. It's not just that we draw a line on the map and suddenly everyone says, hey, the border's here. We have to be ordered to be, for the border to be effective. We have to be able to um, have that line being recognized by people being able to move across one line to the other one, to have this identity being respected as a national citizen of Afghanistan or Pakistan being respected it's through these everyday acts. But the other point that I also wanted to just allude to at the end is perhaps related to the first question that was raised about how is it that ordinary people navigate and negotiate these everyday forms of identity? And how is it that people um, actually in the cities are dealing with these various forms of identity? And on one level, you cannot escape the importance of, say, identity cards in mobility. And that's not just something that affects Afghans, it also affects Pakistanis. Um, things have calmed somewhat in recent times, but mobility within the city is securitized. So you need to have an identity card you know, in many cases, unless you, and it's also mediated by class. You know, if you have a nice car and if you are from a privileged background, you can be mobile in the city in many ways and without any problems. If you are traveling by foot, if you're traveling on public transport, the chances of you being profiled are always much, much higher. Um, so on one level, you cannot but escape the importance of these, the everyday being border being present in everyday life. But on the other hand, you have these entire neighborhoods, such as the one in which Balbasha has grown up in, which are where both Afghan nationals and Pakistani nationals have been living side by side for 30 to 40 years, have been intermarrying, have been going to the same schools with each other, and have been you know, building businesses, working in construction sites and the like together. I had a case um, of um, an oral history once that I uh, was doing in a particular area. It was one town down from where Balwasha was living. And there, a diehard Pakistan cricket fan of Shahid Afridi, who had posters of him across the wall, had been arrested. He was an Afghan national, he was 16 years old. Um, and he had been arrested um, during a time when large numbers of Afghans were being arrested under the guise of the, foreign, um, the Foreigners Act for not being legally allowed to stay in the country when actually they were allowed to stay in the country. And what happened in that particular area is all of his friends had kind of gathered around to get enough money to pay 
the police station, the, <coughs> the bribe that needed to get him released. So in these everyday kind of um, negotiations, these identities, um, they're not insignificant because identity is still significant even within Pakistani communities of what ethnicities or what groups or what classes are marrying or not marrying with each other. They're certainly still significant, but they're certainly not the obstacles that one comes to imagine in the negative discourse that can sometimes be seen in the media and certainly from these repatriation policies that are being pushed on the ground. And there are alternative ways of imagining social organization that are taking place on the ground. And this is what I'm really interested in as well, is trying to understand and tease out these stories of how it is that people are able to coexist and co live with each other and what this does for a form of uh, identity. And it's interesting that Farwa Shah was always hesitant to say, she would never say she was Pakistani, but she would certainly say that she was from Peshawar. And I also had a similar experience in Karachi where people would very proudly say, no, no, we're from, we're from Karachi. And they would very proudly say, no, we're from Karachi. We're not like those ones from Peshawar, the ones in Peshawar. And we're certainly not like the ones that are in Kabul. We're from Karachi. And the city allows that identity in a way that the nation perhaps doesn't. Um, and you see it with various migrant communities in other diasporas in the world as well, where the attachment to the city is always a bit more easier somehow. And, and that was always quite interesting to see. Thank you very much, Sana, for a wonderful presentation. And I think it was uh, for Pakistan, Iran, and Afghanistan, it was very unfortunate that within a span of uh, like uh, two or less than three years, they caught between, between three kind of revolutions that changed the regimes and completely changed the, absolutely the geopolitical strategy of the region, with Shah being toppled in Iran. Bhutto being uh, executed by uh, Ziaul Haq and in Afghanistan, of course, the communist uh, revolution and then the Soviet invasion. And it's interesting to see that at that time, the government in Afghanistan was trying to prevent the, the influx of refugees from Afghanistan to Pakistan, mm. who were going often through the unofficial borders. Because in 1982, I think, or 81, when my father went to Pakistan because at that time was a uh, visit of the, His Highness the Aar Khan was happening in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So he had got permission from the government from his job to go to Pakistan. When he came back, he told me that the border, the Torkham border was mm -hmm. almost no one and the government was not allowing. But now you see that the Afghan government is trying to resist the, the, the incoming of the mm -hmm. refugees back to Afghanistan. So the picture of refugees always changes very very much. I think uh, one thing that uh, in your presentation, I mean, you didn't say, or I don't know whether you uh, covered or not, because I personally did research in Pakistan and I have been to Pakistan myself as well. Although the, the police force is not uh, uh, treating the refugees well, but the Pakistani public is really very friendly towards uh, the Afghan refugees, really very, very friendly. And I have experienced that. And I think in your future presentation, you can focus on that as well. But the other thing is that, you know, in your presentation, your focus was too much on the, I was, I'm not going to say too much, I think the balance was more on the side of the state, mm -hmm. because you still look from the top down, where the story of uh, Parvash is just one. I think there is a lot of room for uh, telling and being researched from below that how the refugees are speaking. Because when we talk about refugees, we are not talking just about the individuals from Afghanistan, but once they enter Pakistan, they are divided right from the 1970s, where they go to refugee camps, where at that, that time they were mistreated between different uh, 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 jihadi parties with the support of the Pakistani government, and all these things were very political and for strategic purposes. Uh, so I think uh, particularly the issue of women and the education, madrasas, and all these things, horrible things have happened. So I think those things, if you look from below, that will really give you that picture from below. But at the moment, it's really very much from the focus of the state. But my question is that, uh, when did you do your ethnographic uh, observation? I mean, which year was that? And whether you were following a particular line of inquiry or something? Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you very much for the comments and, and for your questions as well. Um, <clears throat> Um, I would encourage you when the book comes out to certainly to read it, which 
And the, the book, this is part of what I'm sharing with you today, is really building on a manuscript that I'm hoping will be out, um, if not in the fall of this year, but in the early next year. Um, and part of it um, is looking at the, the impact of the state and the broader narrative, which I'm always guilty of doing because by training I'm a political scientist and I cannot help but to see the state everywhere <coughs> I am. But the, the work itself also builds on ethnographies that look at three particular case studies of informal housing areas where I am reconstructing these micro histories from below to try to bring that out a bit more. And but I may have just gone on with the borders and the identity card a bit too, too much today. But thank you for, for that comment as well. And I think you are quite right of saying um, that in terms of public relationships, there haven't really been cases of out and out kind of hostilities or cases of real violence between Afghans and Pakistani communities. Um, but this doesn't mean that various forms of discrimination, for example, don't take place. Um, the, the media clips that I showed at the beginning are really kind of taking place. They take place after a particular attack takes place. So those also uh, should be taken into account, but so too, of course, should be positive. And in terms of when exactly did I do the field research, um, it's been over a number of years. I did a very intense period of research um, in 2010, 2011, 2012. Um, where I was doing these micro histories, looking at how, say, an informal housing area that's made up of Afghans and Pakistanis got access to water. But I also continued on doing um, research in punctuated ways, what I call punctuated and fragmented ways, because of the nature of the people that I'm working with, who themselves are mobile across borders, across cities, um, and uh, across various locations. So that field work has been really based from early years of 2010 to 2012, but then since then, 2015 to 2017. Um, I was teaching in Peshawar University, and when I was doing those particular chants from 2013 onwards, I was able to do longer periods of research that were more consistent. So for example, over you know, a few months. But when I've kind of done what is often called these parachuting ins and outs, when people who are based in different countries doing field work, they may have been over a month or two months. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Very insightful, very interesting. Uh, I just had one particular question. Uh, obviously, within the Pakistani community, Afghans have traditionally, I assume, and from my knowledge, occupied with on, predominantly of the margins. And obviously, Pakistan faces a lot of exposure to hazards and natural disasters and those kinds of issues. I wonder if anything came up in your observations and in your interactions with people about how those issues in shaped people's lives, because oftentimes they were living on land which nobody else essentially wanted, and so sort of, that's the informal settlements, right? Where they sort of set up camp, and how those perhaps shaped ideas of resilience, because traditionally Afghans pride themselves, right, on the idea of resilience, yeah. and you know, uh, it's we don't take no nonsense kind of. So how I, perhaps the, you've observed something, or and how those kind of ideas have shaped and been shaped? Can I just ask you just to repeat the first bit because I thought it was quite interesting, but I just want to make sure I've got it. What did I say? <laughs> You said something about how people have been affected by disasters. Uh, yeah, obviously because Pakistan has an exposure to natural disasters, all kinds of right? whether it's earthquakes, tsunamis, or floods, or whatever mm -hmm. it is, and the the people who are most seriously often affected are the mm -hmm. people traditionally on the fringes of society and the most vulnerable, and the, those the most vulnerable often are the refugees and the people who don't have any legal standing or even communal standing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think that's a really, really interesting kind of question, which is why I asked you to repeat it again. And I think, I mean, I was in Pakistan in the 2020, 2010 floods, and then when they happened in Sindh the, the year after as well. And it was, you know, you had, with particularly with Afghan <coughs> communities who were often on these rural to urban interfaces who were being displaced yet again, and would often say that, hey, we've been displaced yet again. But what was interesting, when many Afghans have been displaced, they often opened up their homes to also the Pakistanis who had been displaced. And two camps, of course, on the outskirts of Peshawar in uh, Shamshatu also opened up and became, Jalazoi became uh, homes, um, so Shamshatu became a home for a number of Afghans there as well. Um, and in terms of um, this narrative of resilience, that's certainly something that did appear a number of times um, by certain groups. But there was also a very 
cognizant awareness of kind of the structural inequalities that people were facing. The resilience and um, the idea of being a resilient community was certainly there, but people were also very, very aware that the, the lives and the inequalities that they were being subjected to. So for example, if you're in a marginalized community um, and you know the floods happen, your home is more likely to get washed away because it's built on the wall to live in interfaces. They were very aware that their resilience was also shaped because of their material conditions and structural inequalities. Um, but it's true certainly for groups who are considered non-citizens, when it comes to bigger issues, um, they are often overlooked. So within the Pakistani left or within the Pakistani liberal left, when it comes to charitable organizations that are geared towards issues of say water relief or health relief, sometimes these groups and communities are not looked at straight away. There was an incident where, for example, um, there was a feminist collective who were organizing for low income Pakistani women. But there were also low income Afghan women who were often overlooked and overseen. So part of the task, of course, is to how is it that these lives and these individual lives can be eliminated as well. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, the first one relates to your position as an ethnographer in the sites that you were doing your um, participant observation. Um, so I'm wondering about how you navigated the complexities of like power, gender, and all that, um, especially like for example the registration centers, um, and how you secured your ability to do your research there, and like how long maybe it took before you kind of became a fly on the wall before people were noticing you, because um, that's also interesting in the example of the sunglasses lava that you mentioned. How were you able to observe such incidences? Um, so I'm curious about that. The second question relates to the uh, identity cards. I don't know about the Pakistani contest. Do all citizens have to carry um, an identity card with them? And do all identity cards include kind of a uh, region of origin even for Pakistanis? And that's coming from a question related from my experience in East Africa where there's similar kind of mm. identity cards and we, where they also oddly mention like places of origin, and I'm kind of curious about the colonial history that may be related to these um, um, kind of documentation of citizens and control of the citizens. So those are my two questions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so everybody in Pakistan who is a Pakistani citizen over the age of 16 is required, uh, sorry, over the age of 18 is required to have a identity card. <clears throat> In some ways, this has been quite liberating. So for example, for young women who are able to get, it's quite an event when you turn 18, everyone gets their you know, hair blow dried or the dupatta is kind of like done quite nicely and you're going to get your ID card because it allows you some form uh, of mobility or more mobility than previously. Identity cards were usually only given to the household head, such as the male. Um, and in terms of region of identity and the Pakistani identity card, it will say what province you are from. Um, it won't specify an ethnicity, it won't specify a religion, it will specify your gender, um, and it will specify your date of birth, and, for, and it will also, for, you know, say, for women, it will say your husband's name or your father's name as well, right? <laughs> um, will also be there. But in Pakistan, because of the ethno-federal structure of the state, the origin of your province can be an indication of what your ethnicity is from. So if, for example, on your ID card it says Balochistan, the likelihood of you being associated or assumed to either be Baloch or Pashtun is much higher because in Balochistan, the majority of the population are Baloch and then followed by Pashtun. And the same applies then <clears throat> if you are from Khaybar um, Pakhtunkhwa, which used to, and then previously the federally administered tribal areas. So in that context, <clears throat> it, um, it's not a direct marker of ethnicity, but it is kind of a giveaway as to potentially where you could be from. And um, in Afghanistan, there has been a bigger debate over the Afghan identity card in the Ethiopia in Afghanistan about whether or not ethnicities or ethnic groups should be included. In Pakistan, ethnicity um, is not included, but um, on the Afghan citizen card that's in Pakistan, which is different to the Ethiopia card in Afghanistan, your province and origin in Afghanistan is indicated. Um, but the picture is not as clear cut as it is in Pakistan, where the four provinces can quite clearly tell you, perhaps, not clearly, but in two cases, can tell you your ethnicity in a clear way. Unless you're from, you know, 
none of the are in Afghanistan, or the eastern provinces. So it's slightly different in that way. Um, and yeah, thank you for the question on the ethnography and how it was that I was able to do my research in these registration centers. Um, and positionality certainly kind of shapes what you're able to see and what you're not able to see. It took me a long time before I could become that fly on the wall, mainly not because I was read immediately as someone different. A lot of the time people in the center themselves were quite busy. I myself just felt totally out of my depth. When I first started my research, it was the registration center that I had started on. And it took me a while to kind of get accustomed to being in the center. Um, in order to be present at the center, I had to get effectively informal kind of approval by the state. Right? So by going to a government official and saying that I'm going to do research on Afghans in Pakistan, is it okay if I'm a presence at the research center? And technically, I'm sure there must have been another formality that I may have had to do, but I basically hit some English as I'm you know, speaking in an English accent, which is one of the techniques that I used on fieldwork to impress the officials that I was doing some interesting work and I asked them very nicely, would you allow me to be in the registration center to do observations? I just want to sit and take notes. And they were really puzzled as to why this kind of slim girl want, and that's how they read me, this you know, slight being wants to be in the registration center and just taking notes. They're like, okay, well, what are you going to be doing? And I'm like, I'm just going to be there with my notepad and like watching what's going on. They just thought I was insane. They were just like, what is this woman doing? She's just, and I would just go there from early morning. And so, and of course it's a privilege, right, to be doing this ethnographic work when people's lives are so busy and concerned about earning incomes and getting their bread and going and doing much more important things. So I was of course doing very, very privileged work and for that reason, perhaps they thought, okay, well, we'll just let her be. Um, but I did need to get official clearance to be able to do this. I later also engaged in observations of the United Nations High Commission for Refugees and the government of Pakistan's population surveillance processes of Afghans um, in Pakistan. So watching how people have been having surveys and censuses done. And that involved kind of going with the field groups across all of these different locations who were carrying out these surveys and censuses. And I was really, um, and again, I had to get informal position. And again, they just thought, okay, why does this woman want to come with us to all of these other places? But it was interesting um, because I kind of just sat there quietly and was interested to see these processes taking place where the UNHCR surveys would ask questions of like, you know, 100 questions and then do you face police harassment? And every single person answered no. And over the course of these years, I did, I say, you know, maybe 500 interviews. And the vast majority of my people, by virtue of the way in which I was doing interviews, said, yes, we have faced police harassment. So it was interesting what the institution of an international organization can bring to the ways in which people answer or don't answer questions. Um, but certainly making the state aware that you, I was doing work on the front, I kind of had to do that because the population themselves are quite heavily surveilled and have been since the 70s and 80s because of the bigger context of, at that time, the Soviet Afghan War. I think we have one more question. And, uh, or no, we don't. We have more questions. Um, perhaps we can do them in a row and perhaps they can be short as well as the answer can be a little bit short. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you gave a lecture at the University of Cambridge about one and a half, two years ago as well, so I was there. Um, you provided a lot of insights and uh, into the Afghan story in Pakistan. Um, I'm just wondering how has the situation changed for Afghans in Pakistan over this past one and a half and two years, for better or for worse? And very quick second question, uh, you mentioned how well often uh, Afghans have uh, integrated or assimilated into Pakistan, but I first hand felt this and my belief was confirmed to the uh, cricket match at mm, the World yeah. Cup last year, yeah. where um, there has never been violence between even between the crowds of, of Pakistani and Indian uh, nationalities, but there was between Pakistan and uh, Afghans. Uh, what do you think is the reason for that? Is it political, historical, or are there any other reasons? Thank you. Hi, thank you for the talk. So uh, during the Afghan civil war, Pakistan sided with the 
Taliban thing. And uh, like that generation has blamed the state of Pakistan for the condition of the Afghan migrants. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they had to flee their home. Have you interacted during your research any of the like migrant community member was born in Pakistan, who still blames Pakistani state for that, taking that side. In fact, because in 1986, Pakistan were among the three countries that officially recognized the Taliban government. So did you like meet anyone during your research who still blames Pakistani state for that? Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering that in your ethnographic research, did you come across any cases which could highlight how the border making process was different for Afghan males and different for Afghan women. Just was interesting if you can uh, highlight some of those cases. So I'm going to try to be very brief, so you will have, you, you have to excuse me um, with this question. So um, it has much changed in the one and a half years. I feel like it's stuck in the same cycle of Afghans being issued a one year or a six month or a three year extension on their right to remain in Pakistan. The state saying, you know, everyone panicking, saying, oh my God, they're going to be kicked out. And some are, and then some remain. And then the ID card is effectively renewed. The Afghan government, on the other hand, says, actually, we can't take back people. And I feel like it's stuck in the cycle. So from that November 2017 time where we would have met in Cambridge, um, those same debates seem to be reappearing on the surface. So um, I think at the moment, it seems to be a process that is very much similar to what has happened in, in the past one and a half years. There hasn't been a dramatic change per se, but certainly tensions between the two states seem to be you know, continuing on as they are in terms of rising, sometimes heavily. Um, in terms of the cricket match, which itself, I mean, I watched Shoei Bakhtar kind of like go on a rant against kind of like the Afghan team on YouTube before the match unfolded and was somewhat horrified um, because of course the Afghan team, many of them have been um, you know, trained in and lived in Pakistan, especially for Shalva. But in terms of why the violence broke out and the violence particularly that took place in London, I think that may be to do, certainly it's to do with the reflection of a rivalry that's emerging that once used to be the case between India and Pakistan. But I also think it's a story of diaspora. I think it's also a story of, in this context, British living, British born, in some cases, of Hans and Pakistanis having a rivalry and machoist kind of like politics amongst each other. I don't know specifically why the fight broke out myself, so I don't want to speculate that it certainly was, because I know over social media it was reported as being between, because of the Afghan Pakistan rivalry, but some have said on the ground actually the story was a bit more to do with gung ho machoism. Uh, yeah, but, but you know, but I think it's, I do think it's an important kind of, um, I mean, I thought at the time, is this the new rival of the, the Pakistan Afghanistan one? But, um, yeah, but in terms of have anybody blamed the Taliban, I think the people who live within Pakistan, Afghans and Pakistanis are complex beings. Some of them, you know, they are not, have they blamed the Pakistani state? I think they're certainly aware of the political conditions that are shaping and governing their lives. And they themselves are complex beings. There's not necessarily kind of this notion that, you know, um, we have to blame the state and the Pakistani state. I think they have quite complex pictures, but they understand that the politics that have kind of gone behind certain factions of the state supporting um, the Taliban and the right-wing Islamists as well. So they're very aware of what is happening, but themselves are quite complex beings. Um, and in terms of ethnography and is the story different for women? Yes, it really is. Um, it's different in a number of ways. Um, and one of the ways in which it's different is that often the sites of violence in which these border makings take place are not taking place on women. So in many ways, a lot of the times profiling is, happens in more violent ways on men. Right? Um, and that's the case in the Afghan context. In the UK, profiling of the Muslim woman who wears the headscarf means that she is vulnerable and the Muslim man, for example, in the UK's context. In the Afghan Pakistan context, women are not profiled in the same way that Afghan men are. Therefore, these everyday performances of violence, such as sunglasses, rather, don't take place in the same way or the same scale. But that doesn't mean to say that cases of violence and um, by various state authorities don't take place. They do. They often just go underreported. Um, but what's interesting about, say, for example, the violence of the identity card, it has actually pushed more and more Afghan women to be um, 
given their own identity cards and their own individual identity cards. And these registration centers, you'd see the first image, the image is blocked out. It's women who are being photographed and it's women who are kind of part and parcel of this automated process. And I did do an interview in an area where I was based in for a year in Karachi, where Afghan women, where there were mass arrests taking place and Afghan women were also arrested as well at that particular juncture. And I remember the community feeling quite aggrieved by the fact that in this instance, women had been arrested. And so I tried to be super brief, because I do a good job. <laughs> <Indeed>. <laughs>